All right, gang. Moving right along, we're going to start talking about heat injury, then we'll get into hypothermia, um, and then we'll be done. 15 slides, which we'll power through for the week. So just like we did with elevation, we need to have a couple of kind of key uh, discussion points. The next two or three slides are going to have a little bit more information on each one of these uh, heat injuries. So I'm not going to insult your intelligence and read through line for line on the next couple of slides, but let's at least talk about these. Anytime you have hyper thermia. It just means that you have an elevated body temperature, right? Hyper high thermia temperature. So hyperthermia, higher body temperature. There's a couple of different heat related problems. So not heat injuries, but heat related problems. So heat syncope, syncope means fainting and then heat cramps. I'm sure you guys have had some sort of uh, calf cramp or big toe cramp or foot cramp or chest cramp or whatever. Um, they can be a result of dehydration incomplete uh, mineral status, incomplete electrolyte status, that type of stuff. The kind of next big step up when it comes to heat injury is going to be heat exhaustion. So heat exhaustion does not always require medical attention, but it might. So it's, it's in terms of severity, it's not severe, but it's not, not severe. It's not incredibly life threat. It's not life threatening, but it's also not something that you should just bat an eye at, right? Next big one up is a true medical emergency. That's going to be heat stroke. Raise your hand if you ever had a heat stroke. Yep. Um, I'm sure several of you have, especially like my soccer players, or distance athletes. It's not uncommon to watch someone fall out with a heat stroke. Same thing with football when you're geared up. Um, it makes it really hard to cool the body. One of the best ways to actually treat is going to be cold water therapy. So you guys talked about this in Dr. Jekyll's class. Um, cold showers, cold immersions. That type of stuff is going to be the best way is to try to bring the body temperature back down. Why? While we're on the slide, sorry. Why would a change in body temperature be a bad thing? Oh, yeah. Oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Remember it. So just like I said, next couple slides are going to have a little bit of information on each one of these, these kind of heat-based injuries. Um, don't – you need to know – a lot of this, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by going through it, but you need to at least know signs and symptoms for heat exhaustion versus heat stroke. Two major differences you need to pay attention to. Before we really dive too much further, we need to talk about, sorry, my eyes are itchy. It's like allergy season. Um, before we really go too much further, we need to talk about how humans thermoregulate because some of our adaptations, the heat exercise are going to be related to how we actually thermoregulate. So we have a couple of different types of, of heat loss. One, we have evaporative heat loss. So we actually lose sweat when we lose sweat, when sweat evaporates off of our skin, it technically cools our skin. If it's a hot, humid environment, you're not going to have evaporative heat loss. So you're not going to actually lose heat through that way. Radiation is the loss of heat waves, loss of heat directly off of the body. We control evaporation. We control radiation based heat loss a couple different ways. One, we actually vasodilate our blood vessels moving towards our skin. So we actually push blood towards the skin so that as the skin, as the blood reaches the skin, it's passing closer to the surface and it allows for the release of heat. It goes from a higher heat to a lower heat, right? It's moving down its, its gradient. Another way that we're going to lose heat is based off of conduction. Same way if you grab an ice cube, you transfer your heat to the ice cube so it melts. You're actually going to be able to transfer your heat and lose your heat towards another thing. So you actually are able to conduct heat away from your body. And then lastly, um, you're going to have convection or non-touching heat loss. This is basically when wind is blowing past you and wind is actually touching your skin and cooling your skin. I don't know why it's coming off of this dude right here. I guess he farted or something. When it comes to heat-based injury, there's a couple of major factors. First factor is really going to be fitness. If you're the higher the fitness of an individual, the lower the risk of heat injury. The more fit an individual is, the less likely they are to achieve or have a heat-based injury. Does that mean it's impossible? No, absolutely, 100% not, right? The entire field of kinesiology has an asterisk on it, but it's like a, a asterisk of a what if. You can definitely still have fit individuals having heat stroke, heat illness, heat illness, heat injuries. The other major factor is gonna be acclimatization. If you have lived your entire life in Georgia, you know how hot Georgia gets. 
your body is used to exercising in Georgia heat and Georgia summers. You bring a team from Washington State, you bring a team from uh, Maine down to Georgia during the middle of summer, it's not going to be a good thing, right? Like they, you're not acclimatized. You're not able to perform to the same level without your body um, not shutting down, but without your body freaking out some, right? Like it's a bigger divergence away from homeostasis. So we can actually acclimatize. We can actually get used to that stress. We can actually adapt to that stress. One of the best ways, one, one way that you can kind of get acute acclimatization or quick acclimatization is actually exercising in a heat for 10 to 14 days. So you'll see a lot of times pro sports, international sports, they'll actually fly to an area um, and they'll be in an area for several weeks before they actually compete. And the goal is this, is they want to actually acclimatize. This can be done at altitude. This can be done with heat, cold, whatever, All right? One of the, a couple of the major adaptations that are going to be occurring. First, we're going to have changes in plasma volume. So if we increase our plasma volume, we're going to actually be able to increase the amount of sweat loss that we can have. We increase the fluid, we increase the amount of sweat loss without having dehydration. Another thing that we can have is we're actually going to be faster to sweat. We have a quicker sweat time or a quicker time to sweat, I guess is a better way of putting that. So you're actually able to get to a cooling spot faster. We're also going to be able to control our sodium at the kidney level. So our body will actually get used to reabsorbing and absorbing sodium at the kidney level in order to help maintain that plasma volume. And we can help to keep a lower body temperature despite the, the thermal stress, the thermic stress from the environment. Another couple of factors, these are going to be things that are less controllable, right? Clothing, the amount of clothing. You wouldn't go outside and run in a sweatsuit unless you were a wrestler because you would overheat, right? Just the same way. If, if cooling, if one of the ways of cooling is by conduction, we need to have as much skin exposed in order to get that conductive heat loss. If we need to lose heat from sweating, we need to be able to have as much skin exposed to the environment in order to facilitate heat loss. So in general, we want to have as much skin as possible exposed. We want to have, like if you're if you're a male or a female, right? Like it's it's running with as essentially as little of clothing as possible um, while still maintaining a level of modesty in order to facilitate the level of sweat loss and convective cooling that we actually need. The, the external environment is also going to play a big role here, right? The higher the humidity, the lower the sweat concentration gradient, the lower the vapor concentration gradient, or the lower the gradient is for, for the flow of evaporative loss. So if it's a very humid day out, you're not going to be able to get sweat loss. You're, not going to, you're actually just going to sweat and sweat and sweat. Your body's going to pour out sweat, but you're not going to lose that sweat. It's not going to evaporate. So you're not actually going to cool yourself whatsoever. Like wiping off your skin is not cooling. It has to be converted into water vapor for it to be a cooling sensation or to actually literally be cooling. Another one is wind. Wind can actually improve heat loss. It can actually facilitate heat loss. If it's a completely still day, there's no convective heat loss that can occur. So this is a good figure for you guys to remember. Essentially, there is all these all these factors coming into heat injury, right? Acclimatization. We need to know how the human body is physiologically adapted to that stress. Our fitness level plays into our acclimatization. We need to know how the external environment is playing a role here. What does the wind look like? What's the temperature look like? What's the humidity look like? How much clothing is an individual wearing? What's their hydration status? Each one of these mechanisms plays into a heat-based injury. So if you're an athletic trainer or you're a physical therapist or you're an emergency technician or, or whatever, you need to know these primary mechanisms of heat injury. So how do we actually calculate the environmental heat stress, right? What is, what is the environmental heat stress? Well, a big one that we're going to use is wet bulb globe temperature. This is something that the military uses quite a bit. I'm sure the cadets have at least seen this device at some point in time. Essentially, it is a combination of several different things. We're going to have a dry bulb temperature. We're going to have a black globe temperature. And what we're doing is we're looking to see what does the temperature look like in general outside. So that wet bulb globe temperature is basically going to be broken down into a dry bulb temperature, a wet globe, and a black globe. The dry bulb temperature is essentially the, the ambient temperature in the shade. The black globe is going to be in the direct sunlight, and then the wet bulb is actually going to be the humidity level as being taken into account, or the water level, or the, or the convective loss level. So 
that's essentially a thermometer that's wrapped in a wet cloth and gets wind expressed across it and it can actually technically drop the, th the temperature a little bit. Just like you have heat-based injury, you need to know about cold-based injury. It's something that we don't experience too often here, but realistically, anytime there, we're in a non-thermoneutral environment or we're in, a, we're in an environment that might potentially expose us to some level of cold, you need to know about these cold-based injuries. It does still get cold here in the winter, I know. Essentially, for at, at a 2 degree Celsius body temperature loss, you're going to have maximal shivering occurring. At four degrees Celsius, it's going to be ataxia and apathy, right? Like a complete, uh, at six degrees, you're looking at unconsciousness. Any, any further decrease in hypothermic um, body temperature is going to realistically start looking at death in, in a slow build up, slow progression of death. You can literally freeze to death, right? I know you guys know this, but it's going to be at these specific temperatures that it's actually occurring. Very similar, but a little bit different from heat-based injury. Cold-based injury is going to have four primary effectors. It's going to have heat production, so the ability of the human, the ability of the participant, the ability of the animal to actually create heat. What's their muscular contraction look like? What's their ability to perform work look like? There, and there's going to be descriptive characteristics and anthropometrics. So men are less likely to get cold than women. It could be a subcutaneous body fat thing. It could be just gender-based differences in hormones. Regardless, biologically, women get colder faster than men. It's also going to come down to insulating factors. So the amount of subcutaneous, the amount of subcutaneous fat that an individual has is actually going to create a, a more resistant phenotype to cold weather. The clothing, if it's hot, if it's wet or dry clothing, wet clothing is going to get colder faster and it's going to actually cool the individual off more, which isn't what we want. And then there's also going to be the environmental factors. What's the ambient temperature? What's the actual temperature like, like outside? Is it still watery outside? Like, is it still a cold, wet cold? Or is it a dry cold? And then what's the wind look like? That wind will actually facilitate heat loss as well. So we need to take into, effect, into account all these different factors when we're looking at hypothermia. Just like we had the environmental factors when we were dealing with heat injury, we have them again for this cold base injury. Temperature. So we need to know what the gradient loss is going to look like for radiation loss and, and just our general gradient loss of heat. We need to know what the vapor pressure is because the lower that vapor pressure, the greater the likelihood of evaporation. We need to know about the wind because that wind is going to facilitate chilling. And then we need to know about water. You actually lose body temperature significantly faster in water than you do out of water. The more wet you are, the more likely you are to lose body temperature rapidly, right? Like 25 times greater. That's why it's so important that if you do get stuck outside and it is cold outside, you don't take any risks for like crossing streams and stuff like that. You need to be careful when it comes to body temperature in water specifically. And this is just a kind of a cool graph for you guys to see in 60 degree water temperature you actually will die in about six hours. In 20 degree water temperature, it's minutes until you're dying. So it, it's something that is very serious and you don't really play around with uh, cold water immersion for prolonged periods of time. We talked a little bit about subcutaneous fat providing an insulator. There, there's also going to be clothing that you can choose that will be um, able to insulate better than other types of clothing, right? Like a cotton t-shirt compared to a down jacket is gonna provide different levels of, of insulation. Realistically, I'm not ever going to ask you guys about what CLO units are, but it's, it's a measure of quality of clothing. So the higher the CLO unit, the higher the insulating factor, the, the better. The amount of insulation that you will actually require when you are doing physical work, when your activity, like when your activity level is high, is going to be lower than when your activity level is low. You're going to pr produce mechanical heat. You're going to actually produce metabolic heat whenever you're exercising. So the amount of clothing that you have to wear is actually going to be less. And that's why if you ever go for a run outside when it's a little bit chilly out and say you're wearing a hoodie and sweatpants, you'll notice that you're losing those relatively quickly. You're actually heating up pretty good. One of our body's main factors in how we're going to control early onset cold exposure is going to be shivering. So we actually are going to increase our heat production when we get exposed to cold. It's going to be shivering, right? Like it is a way of producing work 
and increasing the amount of heat that we produce rapidly. Now, I already briefly mentioned this earlier, but just to reiterate, women do tend to lose heat faster than men. Um, when we get exposed to cold water, it's very similar, but outside of water, it, it tends to be very different, and women tend to lose significant heat faster than men do. Could be body composition, could be anthropometrics. Women in general are smaller than men, uh, but it, it could also be a hormonal-based thing. Additionally, older individuals are less tolerant to cold. So like your, your parents, your grandparents are going to be less able to tolerate cold weather than you will be able to. So how do we deal with hypothermia? Kind of the opposite of how you deal with hyperthermia, right? So when it comes to treating hypothermia, realistically, we want to make sure that we're getting them out of the cold. We want to try to move them out of the cold as fast as possible. Kind of like with hyperthermia, we'll move them out of the hot human environment. Hypothermia, we'll move them into a warmer environment. You want to make sure that any wet clothing that they have on them is getting pulled off immediately. So if they have on, if they got soaked in a snowstorm, if they if they got soaked trying to cross the stream for some reason, um, they're sweating high levels, then they need to lose that clothing rapidly. You can also start providing warm drinks and dry clothing. Uh, don't provide alcohol. It's, it's it's not a good thing to provide alcohol here. Like a hot toddy is not the not the goal. You can also put someone into a sleeping bag, try to improve their heating um, and decrease their heat loss. You can actually increase the heat inside of that sleeping bag as well. You can find a source of heat. So actually start applying external heat. Be careful with the type of heat that you are applying. And then start, if, if that hypothermia is actually bad, start preparing for medical evac and start getting ready to have emergency personnel either at least alerted or on the way. All right, guys, another week down, right? One more week of video lectures. Next week, we're talking nutrition. In class, we'll be reviewing for the test. Um, rock on. Until next time.